Hey everybody, welcome back to Jersey First TV. Elizabeth Nader with you again tonight, bringing you another important show. I want to welcome Matthew Nielsen to Jersey First TV. Welcome, Matt. Thanks for having me, Elizabeth. I really appreciate it. Glad to have you here. And the viewers are about to find out why it's so important for them to sit with us for the next 20 minutes or 30 minutes to learn from you. Um, Matt is an expert in some very important issues that we have facing this country, not only school choice, but also CRT. And CRT happens to be the issue we're going to discuss tonight. But Matt, right now you're executive vice president of Charter One, which helps charter schools get off the ground and succeed. And that has been a passion of your school choice has been, uh, but also you're coming out with a book on CRT. So tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into this, why you are so passionate about both school choice and this subject we're talking about tonight, critical race theory. Yeah, thank you so much um, for that introduction. And, and I'm happy to be here to talk about these issues because they are important. Uh, you know, CRT is a hot topic right now. A lot of people are talking about it. School choice is yeah. becoming more and more uh, acceptable and desirable for families, uh, in at least in some part because of CRT and related ideologies and philosophies that are being taught in public schools. And so um, I'm passionate about both of these things for, in some ways, the same reasons, but certainly, you know, in other ways, very different reasons. I have different um, paths into both of these interest areas uh, that have come over time. And so school choice on, on that front in particular, I've always been more, you know, freedom minded anyway. I, I think I was predisposed just to be accepting of the idea of being able to choose where your children attend yeah. a school right. and what they learn. And, um, and so it, it, that was always kind of there for me. But uh, a few years back, I took a job here at Charter One and initially um, started working on just helping charter schools to get up off the ground, special projects and things like that. Um, I don't do much by way of management, day-to-day -day management of charter schools. Um, I'm really helping schools to get up and running. And so I interact a lot with uh, potential board members who want sure. to start a charter school. And I talk with them and learn about why they want to start a charter school. And these issues come up, you know, the things that we're talking about today. Yeah. Um, and so it's been fun. It's been educational for me to learn more about the, the, the landscape, the statutes and laws from state to state and how those differ. Um, some of your uh, viewers will know a lot about that uh, yeah. because yeah. they're interested in, in school choice and, and those issues. Well, we've had um, um, a lot of advocacy uh, build up here in New Jersey, um, and you're right in that people are demanding more and more school choice because of the issues like critical race theory. And so, Matt, what we've seen here in New Jersey and just everybody, our viewers, Matt is actually in Arizona, but he's helping mm -hmm. uh, charter schools throughout the nation. But um, we have seen in New Jersey more and more the curriculum is something that the parents are concerned about. They feel as yeah. though the school is coming to the kitchen table when they shouldn't be and interfering with things that they want to teach their children themselves. So, so CRT obviously would be a reason why someone would start a charter school that amongst other curriculum issues, let's back up a little bit into critical race theory, because yeah. I think there is a lot of confusion about it and maybe not enough education. We want people to be educated on where it comes from the history of it so that they can speak as, uh, as intelligently as possible and help other people understand why it's an issue. So Matt, let's back up a little bit yep. and tell us uh, what is the history and the origin of CRT? So um, if you wanted to go all the way back, you could start back in the 1700s. Um, you yeah. could go back that far. Um, but it just in, the, in its most recent incarnation, when it kind of gained the name critical race theory, that was really in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, Richard Delgado, Derek Bell, and on the heels of those two men, Kimberly Crenshaw. These are kind of like the three names that if you want to know about the origins of critical race theory that you should know. 
Um, and in particular, you know, Derek Bell was kind of the, the, he spearheaded the effort early on. It grew out of another discipline, philosophical discipline, ideology, whatever you want to call it. Um, I like using the word ideology because that mm -hmm. is more fitting right, <laughs> in my right. opinion. Mm -hmm. But, um, but Derek Bell really, uh, took up this idea of critical legal studies along with a, a couple of other men who were very well versed in it and, and pushing on this uh, at Harvard University in the 70s. Um, but they took their ideas, as so often is the case, they took their ideas from other ideas and kind of pieced together these different philosophies and ideologies critical race theories based on another, as I said, critical legal studies, but that it in turn is based on critical theory. Okay. Critical theory was really kind of came into its own in about the 1920s and, and really late twenties and 1930s in Germany. And uh, it's what, if you just Googled the Frankfurt school, then you would learn all about critical theory and mm -hmm. who the early thinkers were about critical theory. And basically what that says, and you see this now in critical race theory, because it's an outgrowth of that. Uh, first, it's a, it's a Marxian philosophy. You notice right. I'm not saying Marxist right. um, because there's a difference, but it's a Marxian philosophy. It says that uh, the really the only real thing that and that I mean literally, the only real thing is power and in this world, right? So I mean physical objects aren't real. These are um, projections of our uh, of our psyche right. and uh, you know onto the world. But the the one real thing is power and um, the the dynamic between people, is always that of oppressor and oppressed. Okay. And this is where that Marxian philosophy right. comes in. And so if you pull that through, just see how that manifests today in mm -hmm. critical race theory, same yes. thing exists. Yeah. So you know, your and your viewers will know that in schools today, what they're telling kids is that they are either the oppressor or they are oppressed. Yeah. And you can try, as I say, you can draw that all the way back to the 1920s in the Frankfurt wow. school wow. and even beyond because this is Marx, Karl Marx in the 1800s. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Yeah. It, it it's power is the only real thing. Power is distributed among people. Um, and is and is mediated by race. Mm -hmm. So uh, that distribution of power is totally dependent on how much melanin you have in your skin. Wow. And so that's mm -hmm. that's the in a nutshell, that's what critical race theory is. So that's such an interesting aspect of it, the historical aspect. You are either being oppressed or you are the oppressor. There are only two options, and it's all right rooted in power. So this is a concept that is now being pushed in the schools, but it's been pushed elsewhere also, has it not? Not just within our school system. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, this is really in every aspect of our lives today. And and you know this, Elizabeth, and, and many of your viewers will know that President Trump, um, was it last year or, or about 18 months ago, he yeah. said uh, he outlawed the teaching of critical race theory in government institutions or right. in government agencies. So it's there. We know that it's there. It's in teacher colleges, which is how it makes its way into school systems. And, and it's been there really since the about 1970, 1971, when um, a lot of teachings were coming up from Brazil, actually, from Paulo Freire. Um, some of your viewers may know about him. He was a critical pedagogist. It's another iteration, a uh, different spin on this. But yeah. but yeah, it's in schools, it's in government agencies, it's in um, 
organizations. I mean, you've seen this as well, where diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts have been pushed into corporations and training trainings are presented to um to employees and they have to complete those trainings in order to be onboarded or to, um, to get a raise, right, you know, to right. be, yeah, it, it, all of those kinds of things. It really is everywhere. It's everywhere. It's all CRT. And we're, we're going to get back to the difference between equity and equality. Cause I think that's a key thing to understand, but you're writing a book on this or you've written yeah. it, you're going to publish it. It's going to be coming out, but you have an interesting story about why you did this. Um, it's very personal. I want you to share that with the viewers. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, about eight years ago, a, a little, maybe a little over that, eight and a half years ago, um, my sister adopted a little boy, the cutest little boy you've ever seen, um, and he's he's black. Since then, um, I have a black, I've gained a black niece. Mm -hmm. I've um, I have four other mixed race nieces and nephews, but all of this began with my my nephew and I. Uh, as when he was adopted, I thought he's going to have a difficult time. He could have a difficult time yeah. in his life. Yeah. And I wanted to learn more about how I could be a good uncle to him mm. and um, help him and what he might go through in his life. And so I started reading some things and I thought, you know, some of them were very helpful and I learned a lot there. And then others, I thought that just doesn't seem right to me. And I started, you know, because they were based in critical race theory, and it just didn't feel right, because yeah. we have a lot of examples, as you know, Elizabeth, of extremely successful, wonderful, um, uh, you know, people that have just made it, right. uh, that have much more melanin in their skin than I do. Right, right. Or, <laughs> or <me>. than you do. <laughs> right. And so yes. I, I thought, gosh, this seems a little simplistic. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if there's more to it. And that's kind of what started me through. So this is a personal path. passion, really, to for your nieces and nephews uh, to be able to be in a world where they're taken at uh, face value, really, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and no longer kind of propagate this lie. What's interesting about things that are slowly over time, uh, to, you know, gain speed in this society and attempt to change the way we think is often there's a little bit of truth wrapped in a greater lie. And certainly we don't yeah. deny, you know, the past that this nation has had and other places no in the world that's been very unfortunate, nor do we deny the need to make sure that all people are, are, you know, created equal and treated that yeah. way. But the, the, the greater lie here is the difference between equity and equality, which seems to be a key aspect to understand about CRT. Can you go into detail about the difference there and the subtleties? Yeah, and and I want to just um, pull in one other aspect here, one other ideology, the philosophy. In this case, I, I think it's fair to call it a philosophy. It's called postmodernism. Mm. Um, critical race theory took on some of these uh, postmodern ideas where language is power yeah. and language um, is malleable. Uh, again, a kernel of truth. Of course, that's the case. Um but this philosophy says that you should use language to gain power. Hmm. And so equity and equality, this um, they get confused all of the time. But this is, to me, the perfect example of how that postmodern element of critical race theory gets used. Yeah. So equity is, in short, it actually says that equality of outcome is what we're after. Mm. At equality says equality of opportunity is what mm -hmm. we're after. Now, mm -hmm. for centuries, America has been the, you know, the home, the land of opportunity, right? right? Um, not the land of equal outcomes. Right. Uh, that's been reserved for places like Soviet Russia right. and Cuba and North Korea. Uh, and so that is a dangerous path to be going down. Yeah. But they get away with this because it sounds good. Equity sounds like equality. Right. Um, the same thing goes for inclusion and diversity. These are good words. Why Why would you not want- Why would you fight that? Right. To right. include people. Right. Right. And so they do get confused. They are um, 
and, and it's it, it is a manipulation. Uh, it is a perversion of the the actual concept. Yeah. But it's it, it's a means towards an end for them. It's a very key aspect of this, and especially when you consider children who have not yet been taught to think critically, who right. aren't really understanding the subtly the subtle difference right between equality and equity. And I believe it was yeah. Ronald Reagan that said um, that America promises equal opportunity, not equal outcome. And, you know, the power of that, I'm sure others have said something similar. So this is important for parents to listen to. And really any adult who needs to think critically, when you hear that word, challenge it. What yeah. does it really mean? Is it the same as equality? And, and we should all as moral individuals want equality, but is equity actually a moral outcome, Matt? It really isn't. I mean, you you described countries that focus on equity and they're not doing so well, are they? They really aren't. And history has shown us that again and again and again, but there's just a, a certain segment of our society, unfortunately, that wants to try again. Yeah. And um, it just, it's a failed experiment uh, time and time again. And it's and it's not just that, right? I mean, that's giving it too much credit, a failed yeah. experiment. Yeah, I mean, true. millions and tens of millions of people have died at the hands of people that were seeking equity, yeah. uh, at least, you know, in uh, that was uh, their stated goal uh, of yeah. what they were pursuing. But, but yeah, it is harmful. It actually harms the people that it says that it's going to help mm. uh, in some ways more than the people that, uh, that are, you know, supposed to be propping it up and, and let's perpetuating talk about it. That. Yeah, let's talk about that. Because I think some really wise people, minorities have stood up and said, hey, wait a minute, you profess to be trying to help us, but you're actually holding us back. And again, it, it deserves some examination. Yeah. So let's go into some examples and say, why is it that this is actually harmful to their very people they profess to be helping? Yep. Fantastic. Um, there's some great examples of this. There's a, actually a really great book. If if your viewers want to pick this up, it's it's um, it was written a few years ago by Jason Riley. He's a writer for the Wall Street Journal. He's a, um, a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. Uh, great writer. The book title is "Please Stop Helping Us," hmm. oh, wow. <laughs> and, and it, it's a great book. He yeah. goes over example after example of how government programs have actually done more harm for the black community mm -hmm. than good. Um, if you want to dig really deep and for a long time, I mean, there's, there are dozens of volumes written by Dr. Thomas Sowell. Um, a lot of your viewers will be familiar with him, but amazing work, uh, empirical work mm -hmm. where he goes into detail and has data to back up everything that he says. Um, and if, if you're not into the, the heavy reading, then check out the, their Twitter accounts. They have some great Twitter accounts, uh, yeah. Facebook videos, uh, YouTube, right. amazing videos, uh, by both of those guys. So there's a lot of information out there. You know, unfortunately as parents, we have to do this work, even as just critical thinking adults, you, you have to look for the information that's not as readily available to say, wait a minute. What are they really telling us here? And, you know, how are we at this point, Matt? We have made so many advances as a country, as a world, but really as a country, we have made amazing advances in this area. I'm not suggesting that in any way we're perfect or that we don't sure. have some more work to do. There's always room for improvement. But how are we at this point where this CRT approach is being pushed so heavily and it's really um, infecting every area of society? Why are we facing all of this now? So your your viewers will be familiar with this term, the, the slow march through the institutions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this has been going on for decades where, uh, you know, radical academics in the, the 1960s just flocked to universities and got their bachelor's mm -hmm. degrees, got their master's degrees, moved up and got their doctorates and then began teaching in in the universities all throughout mm -hmm. the countries and not just through the United States. This is all throughout the West, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the English speaking world really. And, uh, but again, you can draw this back to, to philosophers like Kant and that's really where 
uh, a lot of this starts is with Kant and even Rousseau and then up through Nietzsche and philosophers that um, there's no doubt about it. We're extremely intelligent people and there's a lot of good in there, but you have to, you have to pick out the bad stuff. What, What happened was these folks took the bad stuff and built on that. Right. Instead of taking the good stuff and building on that. And so uh, these ideas have been around for a really long time. But but you're right, Elizabeth, the the kind of coming to a head of all of these concepts now in the past couple of years, say two years, um, that didn't happen overnight. It looks and feels like it's been in the past 18 to 24 months, but that's not the case. These ideas have been propagating through the universities yeah. uh, for a really long time. Well, that is a cautionary tale. Once again, nothing happens overnight. We get places step by step. And what a good description of really the educators have been educated mm-hmm. with these theories. And, and those are, you know, not necessarily your everyday teachers. They're, they're people who are really just given off in the curriculum to teach. But the educators who set the agendas, the right. educators who infiltrate Washington, who have been to these, uh, these universities and armed with this. And really, in some ways, I'm going to use the word brainwash in some cases. Uh, you can use whatever word you want to use, um, but really been sort of doubling down on all of this and decided that it needs to be part of how this nation sees things. So this is this is a great description of why it's happened, what it really is. I know there's a lot more to it, but now we're facing this on a daily basis. We're seeing parents yeah. here in New Jersey at Board of Education meetings. Um, They are upset. They are concerned. They are pulling their children out of school. And certainly school choice is one of the solutions here. But Matt, there are plenty of parents who cannot do that or they don't have choices right now. How do they better educate themselves? What are they saying to these people on board of education? How is how do you recommend that they start to make some impact here and begin to really pull the cover back on this agenda? Yeah, you know, there, there's. Uh, you're right. Not everyone has a choice, and certainly, you know, New Jersey isn't known for its friendliness to school choice policies. No, over not the, yet. Not over yet. the pe- we're working on that, right? Yeah. Um, but but you're right. It's, not everyone has that option to go to a charter school or to um, use an education savings account to send their child to right. a private school. So you're a hundred percent right. Um, What parents can do today is, yes, learn more about it. There are some very simple um, primers on critical race theory that you can find online. And these are, um, they're really everywhere now because it's become such an issue. Check YouTube, jump on YouTube, follow some people on social media that you know have uh, children's best interest at heart and are talking about CRT. There's in particular, Christopher Rufo is a great follow on social media, on Instagram and and Twitter and Facebook. Uh, He's showing how CRT is being manifest in schools. And he writes about that. Um, You know, I I would do that. Start small. Learn a little about what's going on Uh, before you speak up too much in a board meeting. Do a little more reading. Right. Uh, we want to make sure that people that are speaking are uh, are knowledgeable informed. enough yes. yeah. and informed. Well, so, in, yeah. In some cases, I think some of these parents who have done their homework are really educating the people sitting on the other side yeah. of the desk because, you know, it's not as though there is a book, a textbook that's going to be handed to your child that says, the definitive guide to CRT on the front. This is not how it's happening. It's infiltrating at every level of curriculum in ways that you would be surprised. And I think once you understand what it is, the goal of this theory, the goal of the philosophy, the idea, even the simple idea of understanding equity versus equality, now suddenly your radar is up, right, Matt? And you're seeing it show up in the strangest ways. And that's, I think, important for parents to realize they need to look at what their children are doing, right? They need to see what homework they're bringing home. What books are they reading? Hey, yep. maybe go sit in for a few of those class sessions, right? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, I want to make a quick note here that before about 60 days ago, maybe 90 days ago, 
we were being told we, and we, when I say we, I mean the public, parents, families, were being told that your your kids aren't, or you're crazy. Your kids are not being taught critical okay. race theory and CRT in schools. You notice that that stopped. And, and the truth is, no, they're not being taught critical race theory right. in schools. Right. But but no one was saying that, really. Yeah. yeah. What we were saying was, we don't like the ideologies, the concepts, the ideas that you're teaching that are based on critical race theory. Right. We don't like those in our kids' worksheets, math worksheets, when they come yeah. home from school. Yeah. And so, uh, but that's changed, you may have noticed, because these laws have been being passed around the country that ban critical race theory, mm -hmm. racial essentialism, these ideas uh, and it, in classrooms. And so now, the, in particular, the teachers unions have come out and said, well, um, it's important that kids learn critical race theory in schools. So immediately that switch was flipped. Yeah. And they're no longer saying we're not teaching kids CRT. They're saying we must teach kids CRT. Oh, the fight so, is on. The fight is on. Is. And, you know, you mentioned the legislative aspect, too. We also need to look at fighting it from that standpoint, um, which is easier in some states than others. But sure. we also need to look at the ability to ban it from from that standpoint. Here we are again fighting the teachers union. We're not fighting teachers. We're fighting the teachers union. But if we allow this generation uh, to be indoctrinated, it will be that much harder, will it not, Matt, to pull this out of our society? Um, oh, I, I think it's a clarion call right now. Uh, it's urgent right now that we all stand up, um, even if you're not a parent, and understand that, hey, it's not just in school, it's in your corporation. Um, it's in the military, is it not? It's all over the place Absolutely. right now. So learn what it is. Be aware. Now, Matt, you have this book that's coming out um, and it's going to be a fabulous read. I'm sure anytime someone does something from a point of personal passion, it always makes it that much more effective. <laughs> How can people find you, connect with you? Because this, there's so much more than we can talk about in half an hour. So give people um, that information where they can connect with uh, your work. Yeah, so really the best spot to look uh, for me is Educational Freedom Institute, EFI. That's the nonprofit that I founded. Um, you can click on there, efinstitute.org, and then click on About Us, and you'll find me there. Um, I'm most active. I know this isn't the most popular place to be, uh, potentially among your viewers, but um, I'm on Twitter. And We're so there. <laughs> I'm active there. So great. Yeah. If, yeah. if uh, your viewers are on there, check me out there at Matthew Nielsen uh, is my handle there. And I'm happy to interact with folks there. But I, I do share a lot of information on Twitter. That's great. And then we'll find out about when the book comes out, um, which of course we will share with everybody. And Matt, we're going to have you back probably in the fall to talk about school choice. This is awesome. an uphill battle in New Jersey, but like all battles we face in this incredible state, it's worth fighting. And I know people like you will educate us and help us do that. This is the tip of the iceberg, but it's a good primer on CRT. Matt, you're an awesome resource. I appreciate your time on all of this. I hope people connect with you. And we've all got to continue to fight for this. It's really the future of our country, our children, their their minds, and um, you know how we are going to face things 20, 30 years from now. We'll look back and say, did we change it or did we not? Last word to yeah. the viewers, Matt. Well, it's just, it, Elizabeth, I appreciate you having me on here um, to talk about these important issues, school choice and CRT. Uh, yeah, get informed. It's been my pleasure to be with you, Elizabeth. All right. Thank you so much, Matt. And uh, to my viewers, guys, we will see you next.